Colombia is working. And finally, just very quickly, something which is very important about how you should try and get yourself registered if your vision has decreased to a certain level. So just a little bit about the uh, eye and how the anatomy of the eye tells us about how it works uh, properly. So essentially the most important thing when you look at the eye here is that you have the front part of the eye and just behind the colored part of the eye you have the lens. And the reason why you have the lens is because it allows you to focus the light at the back of the eye. If you don't have the lens, you're not able to get a focused image, and that's very important. The second thing is, at the back of the eye, you have the retina, which is the sensitive film which allows the light to be converted into an electrical signal. And this electrical signal is then passed onto the back of the eye, these cells of the retinal ganglion cells. And the extensions of these retinal ganglion cells actually converge at the back of the eye to form the optic nerve. So you can see here how the retina covers the back of the eye here, and then the cells produce the optic nerve which transmit the information to the brain. So essentially, the eye is a very sensitive camera. It converts light energy into an electrical signal. And then at the back, you have the brain here, which is the supercomputer, which is generating the image. And in between, you have the optic nerve, which is the broadband cable, right? And what we tend to have in uh, Wolfram syndrome, as I will discuss, is the optic nerve tends to be affected in this condition for reasons that we still do not know. So, as an ophthalmologist, when I look at, at the back of the eye, that's how the optic nerve looks like. It's a little round circle, it has this golden yellow appearance, and then you have the blood vessels coming out. And the other thing which I want to mention about the eye itself is, the retina is a very sensitive field, but at the back of the eye you have something called the macula, which is the central part of the retina. And if your macula is affected, you end up losing the central part of your vision. And that's a major problem, because you think about what you do all the time, reading, watching TV, and driving, you need very good central vision. So what tends to be affected in Wolfram syndrome is your central vision, and your peripheral vision usually tends to be preserved. So, this is just an overview about the eye and really what can go wrong. So as I've mentioned already with Wolfram syndrome, it is really the optic nerve which takes the greatest hit, right? And this paper published now 20 years ago by Tim and colleagues, it was a very important paper because it really described the prevalence of this condition in this country and also the type of clinical features you get, not just the eye but also the other endocrinological and neurological problems. The one thing really which is very striking is that the two main features of this condition are really diabetes mellitus and optic atrophy, which tend to develop quite early on in the first 10 years of life. And based on all the research that has been done and also this Uruguay program, there are now some very good guidance out there which basically tells you about uh, how these clinical features develop and how you can do, what you can do in terms of management. But one thing which I want to draw your attention to is if you look at the column on the left, these are the two major criteria diabetes before the age of 16, and also optic atrophy before the age of 16. And if you look at the percentage here, it says that 80% of patients with Wolfram syndrome will develop optic atrophy, which is a very high proportion. So just to illustrate, you know, uh, I tend to see mostly adult patients, but I also do see uh, children uh, down at Warfield uh, at the Richard Desmond Children's Eye Center. But just to give you a flavor of the typical referral that you can get, so this is a 40-year-old woman who was referred to me because her vision was gradually getting worse. Uh, she had a bit of hearing loss, not very severe, she did not need a hearing aid, but enough for her to struggle when she was in a very crowded environment. And, she, and the hearing loss was diagnosed at the age of six years old. She was referred to the North County Clinic, and she had a, a brain scan, which was normal. And the first thing that you do when you come to the night department is have your vision checked, right? So this is the standard chart that you will see when you go to see your optician. The, it's measured at six meters, right? And normal vision is six out of six, meaning you can read the bottom two lines of the chart. If you can only read the top letter of the chart, that's 660, right? So when we check her vision, she could only make out the top letter of the chart. So her vision was 660 in both lines. And then when we ch check her field of vision, right, she could not see in the center of the vision, right? So that was the most striking thing when we checked her visual field. And again, that was the major problem I mentioned before, that you can lose your central vision and you start struggling with reading, 
uh, all the most of the day-to-day -day activities that you take for granted when you have no more vision. And this is a normal optic disc, but when I look at the back of her eye, the optic disc no longer has this golden yellow appearance, it's white. Right? And that's what we call optic atrophy. Right? So that's a technical jargon for saying that the optic nerve has a whitish appearance because it's been damaged somewhere or the other. And what was quite interesting is her 10-year-old son also had some hearing problems, again very mild. As far as the son was concerned, his vision was normal. He was on strong, he was doing well at school. Uh, and his vision with glasses was 6'9". So not completely normal, but at 6'9", you know, he was not aware of anything. But when you look at the back of the eye, and if you can see here that the optic nerve looks normal, but there's a tiny little bit which looks a bit pale. Unfortunately, I don't have a very good point here, but if you look here, you can see how this looks a bit pale, compared with the rest of the optic nerve. Right? So to me as an ophthalmologist, looking at the back of the eye with the right equipment, I knew this was not entirely normal. And this was the moment where you can see that the color is much more obvious. So in summary, there was also evidence of the son having some problem with optic nerve. And because both mum and son were affected, we thought that the most likely uh, problem was a dominant genetic problem and we also checked for Wolfram, uh, Wolfram in that part of this, and he did identify dominant WFS1 mutation. So what I want to say here is that, you know, sometimes before someone's aware of any problem they arise, if you look at the back of the eye, you can find evidence that the optic nerve is starting to get damaged, what we call subclinical optic atrophy, meaning that you can see the change, but you're, still, you're not yet aware of the change as the person involved. So that's very important because very often by examining other family members, we can get clues about what the problem might be. So as, uh, you know, as Karen and Tim mentioned, you know, it's something very difficult for other family members to come to the clinic, but very often it helps us to make the diagnosis and also then we can give uh, the right advice to the other family members who might have the same problem but at an earlier stage. So although here the figure is 80%, right? My personal experience of uh, looking at patients with uh, confirmed mutation in this WFS1 gene is that it's probably much higher. Is that with better equipment, we can find evidence that the optic nerve is not working completely normal. It might be 90%, it might be 80%, but still it shows evidence of some dysfunction. And unfortunately, with the optic nerve problem, the, your vision tends to get gradually worse. There's no treatment at this point in time that we can provide, and that's the reason why Fleming and others here are working to identify new drugs that might help not only the brain, but also the eye. And also in terms of whether gene therapy, for example, that might be helpful. There are certain people in France in Montpellier who are working on this. So this is the big gap at the moment, that we, there's not much that we can do to stop the loss of these cells at the back of the optic nerve. So I've talked about the optic nerve. The second thing I'm going to talk is about the retina, how the retina can be affected here. And the way that the retina can become affected is because of diabetes. Uh, as I've mentioned already, diabetes is a big component of this uh, condition. And what happens with diabetes is that when you have high blood sugar, right, this can affect the tiny vessels at the back of the eye. And the way to think about it is that the blood vessels become a bit leaky. And because the blood vessels become a bit leaky, three things can happen, right? Things can go out of these blood vessels. The one thing that can go out is blood. So if you look at the back of the eye here, you can see these tiny blood vessels leaking, and you can see these patches of blood there. And the second thing that can happen is you can have these cholesterol uh, in your droplets that, it, that escape from the blood vessel, what we call hard exudates. And these hard exudates can also affect your vision. And the final thing that you can get is if you don't have enough blood going to the right part of the retina, the retina starts to become, um, starts to swell and you get these so-called cotton wool spots, right? So all these three things, right? Bleeding, hard exudates, and cotton wool spots is because of these blood vessels either being leaky or they are not getting enough oxygen to the right place. But fortunately, that this is something that we can treat, right? And the final thing that you can get is as you get leakage, you can also get a bit of fluid that escapes. So you can get a bit of water logging at the back of the eye, and this is called macular edema. Right? And that can also degrade your central vision. Right? So the most important thing really is prevention. Right? Although we can treat these problems from, diabetes, 
on the amenities in the back of the eye. It's much better if we have volume in the first place, and that's where the endocrinological links here do all the hard work. Because we do know that the longer that you have the diabetes, the more likely you're going to develop a problem in the back of the eye. And the most important thing is how well controlled your blood sugar is. Because if your blood sugar is not very well controlled, then you have a high risk of developing these diabetic eye diseases. And there are other risk factors if your blood pressure is high, you know, if you have high blood cholesterol, and also if you have a problem with your kidneys, right? If you're able to manage all of these correctly, and as an ophthalmologist, I rely on the physicians and also the endocrinologists, then a lot of patients these days don't get severe problems with diabetes at the back of the eye because the, the, the diabetes is well controlled. But if you do end up with problems, right, there are ways to manage that, right? So the most important thing really is how we can prevent these abnormal blood vessels from leaking. Because if you can stop the leakage, you stop all the problems. The most established way of doing this is using laser eye treatment, right? And it's pretty straightforward. You basically sit in one of the little systems here, and then by using a special lens, the ophthalmologist is able to focus the laser at the back of the eye. And the laser actually stops the leakage from these blood vessels, right? It's been used now for the past 30 years. We know it works. Um, and it's something which can be provided if the diabetes can be controlled by conservative manner. Until recently, we only had laser treatment to treat these problems at the back of the eye. But now, if laser is not enough, we can also inject some drugs at the back of the eye, which can stop the leakage. And very rarely these days, because fortunately, diabetic treatment is much better. People get screened once every year at least. But if the eye has been severely damaged from the diabetes, there's scarring there, you can also have surgery, and the vitro retinal surgeons can do a pretty good job these days. And the reason why this is important is because although we can't treat the optic atrophy, right, we can certainly prevent the, pro the complication from the diabetic eye disease. So it is important to prevent the eye from getting more damage when we can stop in the first place. So the final thing which I'm going to mention about the eye itself is how the lens also can be affected in this condition. So about one to, um, it, it's, not a, it's not a major problem, but probably about 1% of patients who have these mutation WFS1 will develop significant cataracts. Right? All of us will get cataracts if we if we grow old enough for that. And if you look at the lens here, you start off with a very clear crystal lens when you're born. But as you grow older, the lens becomes a bit thicker and it becomes more yellow, right? And that's the reason why gradually your vision gets a bit worse once you're past the age of 60, for example. And when the lens becomes too thick and too yellow, your vision becomes blurred, right? So this is the difference between cataracts and an optic nerve problem. With an optic nerve problem, you lose your central vision. Whereas with a cataract, everything just gets gradually, gradually more blurred, right? And the reason why it becomes blurred is the cataract actually allows the light to be spread all over. So the light can't be focused anymore, it just spreads inside the eye. And these are just two papers that were published recently showing that these mutations in the WFS1 gene can cause cataract at a young age, before the age of 20. Right. So this is just an example of a patient I saw in clinic. And fortunately these days, we can do cataract surgery. So cataract surgery is the most commonly carried out procedure in this country. There's 300,000 uh, patients a year who get their cataracts done. It's very good, it's very safe, and you can get very good results from it. So what we do is we use a special ultrasound probe which removes the cataract and then we put a new lens, it's a plastic lens and it does the job extremely well. Right. So if you look at this example here, this is a cataract at the top and then you put a new lens in and then it brings your vision back to what it would have been without the cataract. It can't get rid of the optic atrophy but it will certainly help improve your vision if, if, if the, the cataract is thick enough. So this is really how the eye can be affected, mostly the optic nerve with optic atrophy you have to be careful not to develop any complications from the diabetes. Then lastly, if you're lucky to develop cataracts at a young age, then surgery will be indicated in that situation. So, the NHS is wonderful, right? But unfortunately, we're all suffering at the moment because we don't have enough resources, there are a lot of patients to be seen, the eye clinics are complete madness. And actually, this is not full, this is me one day taking a picture of the eye department 
when we're not that busy. Nowadays, if you come to the art department, sometimes there's no sitting places, really, isn't it? So this is the problem, right? Um, we just need to wait and see what the government will come up with at the spending review at the end of the year. But it's a bit scary, but you see, read the news, right? But that's sometimes translates into what we have to face as clinicians. So if you have to wait for a long time, don't take it to the nurses, right? It's not their fault, right? It's just the way the things are at the moment, really. Right? So what do we do, right? We need to check your vision, right? And it's pretty straightforward. Very often, the doctor won't be checking the vision. It will be either be a nurse or a technician. And if your vision is not very good, then we also try and bring you to see the opticians to check whether or not with glasses can improve your vision slightly because any improvement is better than nothing. And then you will see the, the eye doctor in the, in the clinic and depending on what they prefer, you will either be sat on the table and we will have a look with the lens or the doctor will put this kind of uh, strange you know, headlight on his, uh, on his head and use a lens to have a look at the back of the eye. Right? You know, you spend three years of your training to learn how to use this piece of equipment, but it does the job very nice. You're able to look at the back of the eye very clearly and in high definition, which is very helpful. And then we will be doing other tests, right? What we want to know is, how is the structure? Is it looking normal? And is it working properly, right? In terms of the structure, what we can do is, there's a lot of equipment out there, right? You don't have to worry about this. <clears throat> but the point is that all this equipment are very good because it's non-invasive. No one will be sticking any uh, sharp needles in the eye or anything of the sort, right? You just sit on, on the machine and then the infrared light will just take the images within 30 seconds. And what it tells us is really what is the thickness of the optic nerve and what is the thickness of the regimen, right? So it's very useful because we can use that as clinicians to check whether there's a problem. And also in terms of research, we can check things on a yearly basis and we can document whether or not there is a progression of the uh, damage at the back of the eye. So it's very useful, for example, if you're going to be doing any clinical trials in the future, you can use these tests as a measure of whether the drug is really working or not. And in terms of the function of the eye, obviously we need to know about vision. Sometimes we will measure color vision, and there are various things that we can use. I tend to use the Ishihara, where you basically read these number plates, right? But I must say that once the vision has dropped to a certain level, checking color vision is not that helpful, right? But it's certainly something that we will do in the neuroophthalmologic clinic. And then what we can do also is we can check your field of vision, right? And, you know, these little cute minions, right? We're quite lucky we have two eyes. But my question to you, if, if, you, only, if you cover one eye, right, how much can you see from only one eye, right? So roughly speaking, right, on the horizontal plane, you can see about 150 degrees, right? On the vertical plane, it's about 120 degrees. So if you, only, if you cover one eye, you actually have quite a big field of vision. But with two eyes, you can expand that even further, right? And the whole point of these machines, whether it's the Gorman parametry, whether it's the Humphrey parametry, is a way of assessing your field of vision much more accurately than the doctor checking it by fingers, right? So, if the vision is not very good, the Gorman parameter is much better. And if the vision is better, you can use a Humphrey. So I'm sure that some of you here will have had these tests done. But the reason why we do these tests is to check your field of vision and check whether or not, uh, like this lady I showed earlier, whether there are any bits which are missing, right? So it's a very useful test, uh, but sometimes it can take a bit, of, a bit longer to take. It can take 15, 20 minutes, depending on how uh, whether or not you struggle in terms of your central vision. Right. But this is very helpful to do, right? And the final thing is electrophysiology, right? And for this test, you will not be in the eye department, you will be next door to the medical physics department, right? And the reason why it's very helpful is because, as I've mentioned already, you have this very simple structure. The eye as a camera, the brain as a supercomputer, and the optic nerve as a, as a broadband cable. What you can do is you can check the speed at which the signal is moving from the eye to the back of the brain, right? And to do that, you ba we basically have some special equipment. So we put these little stick-up electrodes on the front of the uh, forehead. We put some electrodes at the back of the uh, head, right? And basically by putting these electrodes, we can measure the speed at which the electrode signal goes from the optic nerve to the brain. And what we do is, 
you sit in front of the big, uh, the big plasma screen there, and then you're going, you're going to see these little patterns, either these checkerboards or these little hexagons, right? And by using these different patterns, you're able to check different parts of the eye and different parts of the brain. This is very straightforward, but it's a very helpful test. So for example, if you have a problem with the optic nerve and you have optic atrophy, right, you will find that the signal is weaker and it also takes longer to travel, right? So we don't do that for everyone, right? But sometimes if there is a bit of debate whether the optic nerve has had a problem or not, we can do visual electrophysiology. And certainly I think this is also quite helpful for the future in terms of research and also in terms of doing clinical trials. So the third part of my talk is on the certificate of visual impairment because clinics are very busy and I must admit that sometimes clinicians will forget about these very basic uh, steps really. Right? But in terms of the CVI registration, there are two categories. Right? You can either be registered as being sight impaired, what used to be called partially sighted, or you can be registered as being severely sight impaired, what used to be called as being blind registration. And this is basically based on your level of vision. Right? So as I mentioned, if you can only make out the top letter on the chart here, that's roughly 660 right? at 6 meters. If you can't read the top letter, what will happen is it will bring you closer to the chart at three meters, right? And if you can read the top letter at three meters, this is three out of 60, right? If your vision is worse than 360, so if I bring it to three meters and you still can't make out the top letter on the chart, then you can be registered as civilly sighted impaired, right? If your vision is better than 360, but it's, it's 660 or worse, then you can be registered as being uh, uh, sight impaired or partially sighted. Of course, there are other criteria that can make you eligible to whether you can be registered or not, but this, this is the main criteria. What is your current level of vision? Right? And the reason why this is very important uh, to be registered is it gives you access to social services, it gives you some um, benefits in terms of tax allowances, in terms of you know, uh, your TV license. So, this is something which is very useful to have. And your low visual aid clinic as an officer in your clinic can help you with this. Right? And the other thing which is also very important is you should also have access to a low visual aid clinic because there are certain magnifying glasses that we can provide you that can improve your reading ability. Right? So as mentioned already, although we can't treat the optic atrophy, you need to make sure that you get the best out of your eye department. And finally, I think the reason why we're here today is to bring everyone together, patients, families, clinicians, researchers, because let's face it, there's so much more that needs to be done in terms of understanding Wolfram syndrome and also coming up with treatment, right? It's frustrating for you because you, know, you are the parents seeing the child losing more and more vision, you are the patients who are actually losing vision, and we are the clinicians who are not doing very much in just telling that things are either stable or getting worse, right? It will take time, right, because it takes up to 10 years to get a new treatment out you know, on, on the market, but you know, there's a lot of work being done, not only here in the UK, but elsewhere, in terms of understanding how the disease works and how we can come up with better treatment. And, but to do that, because it's a rare disease, we need a network for this, right? And we're quite lucky here. And again, I'm saying that there's not a lot of money floating around, but certainly the NIHR, which is our National Institute of Health Research, has invested quite heavily into rare diseases, especially over the past three years. And it's really made a huge difference to us clinicians working in these uh, rarer areas of practice. And Tim here is basically the team lead for the pediatric team for this NIHR rare disease program. And I'm part of the eye disease team. And we've come together, uh, and there's a project which is nearly almost uh, ready to launch on Wolfram syndrome. And that will really allow us to bring together clinicians with an interest in this condition and also do a bit more in terms of collecting clinical data. And this will really be essential in terms of doing these clinical trials. So just to summarize really is, um, as a patient with Wolfram syndrome, you absolutely need to see an eye doctor because the majority of patients will get an optic atrophy, right? You need to make sure that you control your diabetes, so partly you need to have the right lifestyle habits, but also the, uh, the endocrinologist and the physician will be helping you with the right treatment. You should have your eyes checked at least once a year, right? Um, and if you have diabetes in any case, even if you're not able to see a specialist in the, in the eye clinic, you will be screened in your community in terms of the diabetic eye screening. But it's probably better if you see a specialist in the eye department because there are better tests that we can do to monitor uh, the condition. 
And finally, you know, if your doctor has not done that for you, you should try and ask them to register you as being either partially sighted or severely sighted impaired, because you know, <coughs> it gets you uh, onto the right track for getting access to the relevant social services and, and, and help. Thank you very much. Thank you.